Okay, Crystal, it's been a long time since I said this. <laughs> what are you taking a look at? Well. It's hard to look at what he's doing in Ukraine, what his forces are doing in Ukraine, and think that any um, uh, ethical, moral individual could justify that. It's difficult to look at the Sorry. It's difficult to look at some of the images and imagine that any well-thinking, serious, mature leader would do that. <clears throat> so I can't talk to his psychology, but uh, I think we can all speak to his depravity. This is war. It is combat. It is bloody. It is ugly. And it's going to be messy. And innocent civilians are going to be hurt going forward. I wish I could tell you something different. I wish that that wasn't going to happen, uh, but it is It is going to happen. That was National Security Council spokesman John Kirby holding back tears as he spoke of innocents killed by Russia and then casually dismissing innocents killed by Israel as mere collateral damage, chalking up to the unavoidable costs of war. The Biden administration has spent the last several years now rending their garments about the international rules-based order, decrying, with plenty of justification, by the way, Russian atrocities committed against Ukrainians. Biden framed this struggle in grand idealistic terms as a fight to protect the post-World War II order, our arming of the Ukrainians as a noble front in our war for democracy, for human rights. My, what a difference a new war makes. Democrats and other administration officials who had no trouble spotting war crimes when they were committed by resistance lib boogeyman Putin suddenly decided they really weren't qualified to opine on the topic once Israel launched a complete siege of Gaza and bombed everything from refugee camps to schools to hospitals to every sort of critical infrastructure. In the early days, this took the, the form of vaguely encouraging Israel to not commit any war crimes, please, once it became absurdly obvious that the entire military operation was being conducted on the basis of seeing how many war crimes Israel could get away with, they then shifted tactics, adopting a more philosophical posture, you might say. Who can really say whether they're committing war crimes? What even are war crimes, really? Now, there are a wealth of examples here, but let me give you just a few. Here's Senator Ben Cardin on Russia. There's no question about Russia's crime of aggressions, no question about their committing crimes against humanity and genocide. We've had hearings in this committee that have established that. We've had hearings in the U.S. Helsinki Commission that has established the fact that this, all the conditions for genocide have been committed by, by Russia. This same senator was suddenly less sure of himself in a recent interview by The New Yorker's Isaac Chotner. Chotner asked Cardin, do you have a sense of whether Israel is operating according to the rules of war? Cardin dismissively responds, I know that once elected to the United States Senate, I'm supposed to be an expert on every subject. Chotner then replies, sir, you are the head of the Foreign Relations Committee. But I suppose it would be unfair to pick on Senator Cardin here, who is simply taking his cues from so many others. Here's White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on Russia versus Jake Sullivan on Israel. I think we can all say that these are mass atrocities, these are war crimes, these are shocking and brutal acts that are completely unacceptable beyond the pale for the international community. So whatever label one wants to affix to them, the bottom line is this, there must be accountability. And the United States will work with the international community to make sure there's accountability. You said today, uh, as you said a number of times, about the importance of the laws of war being upheld. Um, Israel has killed around 11,000 Palestinians. Around two-thirds of those are women and children. Uh, the situation in the hospitals is dire. Israel has dropped an astronomical amount of uh, ordnance in very built-up areas. Is Israel, in your view, abiding by the laws of war? And well, if it is, how do you come to that conclusion? Well, as I said yesterday, I, Jake Sullivan, standing here, am not in a position to be judge and jury to make that determination. It's a legal determination. This not a judge and jury formulation has become the standard go-to when anyone is asked about Israeli war crimes. I have lost track of how many cowardly Democrats have deployed this moral cowardice in the face of undeniable horrors. Republicans, for their part, they're mostly more brazenly bloodthirsty in their own justifications. This tone, of course, comes right from the top. President Biden himself, no trouble calling Putin a war criminal, accusing him of genocide on Israel. He has not only demurred 
as his advisors did there. But he has actively defended war crimes, such as raiding al-Shifa hospital, causing untold civilian deaths, numbering in at least the dozens, including premature babies. Now, if you're thinking, this war doesn't compare in any way to the brutality that was unleashed on Ukrainians, you are 100% correct. What Russia unleashed pales in comparison to the horrors inflicted on all 2.2 million people in Gaza. It's not even close in the amount of destruction, in the absolute number of civilians killed, in the targeting of civilian infrastructure, and in the denial of the basic needs of life. Substack journalist Caitlin Johnstone recently did an analysis comparing just the impact on children alone. As she writes, Israel has killed as many children as Russia reportedly kidnapped, an action which led to charges being filed at the International Criminal Court against Putin. Why, she asks, is one a war crime and the other apparently fine? Both are awful, obviously, but it would seem pretty obvious that murder is worse than kidnapping. However, we're somehow supposed to reserve our horror only for Putin. Of course, we all know the answer to why we're supposed to apply completely different standards to these two atrocities. It's never been more blatantly clear than right now. International law is nothing but a cudgel to be used against official enemy states. When it's the US, it's our allies, suddenly these crimes are erased, they're excused, and the people who were just pretending to care so deeply suddenly plead complete ignorance. Even the New York Times has begun to report on the unprecedented horrors being unleashed on the people of Gaza. Just based simply on the likely understated numbers, which we know today, they report that, quote, Gaza civilians under Israeli barrage are being killed at a historic pace. They go on. While wartime death tolls will never be exact, experts say that even a conservative reading of the casualty figures reported from Gaza shows the pace of death during Israel's campaign has few precedents in this century. People are being killed in Gaza more quickly, they say, than even in the deadliest moments of U.S.-led attacks in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, which were themselves widely criticized by human rights groups. This article cites the number of targets and the wildly destructive 2,000-pound bombs that have been used. For reference, in the U.S. bombing of Mosul, we judged even 500-pound bombs to be too large for that type of urban combat. The number of women and children killed in Gaza is fast approaching the number that the U.S. killed in 20 years of war and occupation in Afghanistan. It's double the number who have been killed in two years of Russia's war in Ukraine. Now, Ukraine is, of course, a nation of nearly 44 million. Tiny, tiny Gaza is home to roughly 2 million. More than 60,000 buildings have been destroyed in Gaza, and between the level of destruction and the leveling of critical civilian infrastructure, all of northern Gaza has been rendered unlivable. All of this before we talk about the desperate siege conditions clearly amounting to collective punishment, which have been posed on everyone from the elderly to the premature babies gasping for air in hospitals with no electricity. If these politicians and so-called diplomats are suddenly ignorant of the laws of war, they should feel free to seek the advice of experts, such as this gentleman, UN Relief Chief Martin Griffiths. So you have been, you know, uh, on the front line of this since the beginning, but you've also been, you know, UN special envoy and advisor to many, many, many issues. Yemen, Syria, you've been in UNICEF, you've been doing this for a long time, head of uh, relief operations, NGOs, the whole lot. Have you ever seen anything like this? Well, how do you assess what's happening right now in terms of humanitarian needs in Gaza? The worst ever. Christian, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, I started off in my 20s dealing with the Khmer Rouge, and you remember how bad that was, the killing fields and so forth. But 68% of the people killed in Gaza are women and children. They stopped counting the numbers of children killed after four and a half thousand had been counted. Nobody goes to school in Gaza. Nobody knows what their future is. Hospitals have become a place of war, not of curing. No, I don't think I've seen anything like this before. It's complete and utter carnage. I would ask you to really take those words in. When even typical Israel apologist outlet, the New York Times, is acknowledging that the scale of the atrocities committed here outpace any that we've seen in modern history, you know we are watching something historic in the level of evil and butchery. And make no mistake, for all their pleading ignorance, the Biden administration knows that too. That's why they worried that this temporary pause might allow the world to see and really understand what has been done with our backing, with our bombs, with our support by our client state. 
Apparently, hypocrisy and selective outrage has always been the rule of the international rules-based order. Not a soul could deny that now. History will judge with horror those with power who enabled these crimes against humanity. Historians will write that this was when the U.S. discarded its last tattered thread of credibility. And Sagar, you know, the world that we pretended to be enforcing. Hey guys, if you want to see what I had to say to Crystal's monologue, not just this one, all of them going back to the very beginning, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com.